Yeah, thanks everyone. So Diana, welcome. Diana is here from Bozeman. Tori is joining from Bozeman. First growing season here. Tori, it's my first growing season here too. I just moved from a different part of Montana. So I'm excited about this, this area. Um, growing broccoli, lettuce, and flowers. Sounds wonderful and delicious and beautiful. Um, we've got the Emmerich family. Hi, Emmerichs, joining us from Bozeman. And if anybody else wants to introduce themselves in the chat, we're curious where you're coming from and um, what you're excited about growing this season. And then we'll get started in about one minute with the, the webinar, just to give folks a little bit more time if they want to join us and also to let everybody introduce themselves if you feel like it. And since the webinar is being recorded, if you don't want your face on the webinar, I'm not sure if it records that part or not, but you can feel free to um, mute your video if you don't want your face showing, but if you want to let us see your smiling faces, that sounds great too. And we will be answering some questions throughout this webinar. So the easiest way to ask those um, is to type them into the chat feature. If you are having questions at the end, we'll also have lots of time to open up for questions at the end as well. So, but if you have a question or a clarification throughout, Maddie and I are gonna do our best to sort of monitor that chat feature throughout as well. Welcome Lynn. Um, Lynn. Lynn is actually our Montana dietetic intern working with us this week and next week. Um, Lynn's from Maine. Excited to learn what grows best in the more alkaline soil. Yeah, I forgot that they have such acidic soil in Maine too. So not quite as many blueberries readily growing here. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Maddie? Should we get started? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our, our garden webinar. This is our first of two we're gonna do for the Bozeman Seed Library. And we're so um, honored and excited to be a partner in their program. It's just such a great resource, um, the Seed Library in general, and then um, the opportunity for people to learn too. So we're glad to be here. This one is generally about planning your garden, um, where you wanna put things, what you wanna grow, and how to adapt to our climate here in Bozeman. And then next week, Maddie and I will be back with a garden webinar specifically about small space and container gardening too. So um, even those of you who might not have a big section of your lawn to grow in, there are creative ways that you can still grow some, grow some food and flowers and other things for yourself too. So um, maybe we'll see some of you next week as well. So let's get started with this one. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. And I wanted to echo Stephanie and say we are so honored to be here. Um, excited to share what knowledge we have with all of you um, and hopefully help you have really fruitful gardens. So our agenda for tonight is listed on this slide. First, we're going to start with some introductions and then we'll dive into our process for garden planning. Um, so we'll cover what do you want to grow and planning your garden as a family. Then we'll talk about the importance of knowing your climate. And then we'll explore seed packets and all of that useful information that comes with the seed packets. We'll also talk about creating a planting calendar and schedule. And then we'll talk about tips and tricks for planting like succession and companion planting. And at the end, we'll have time for questions. But if you do have a question or you need clarification about something as we're moving through the slides, feel free to pop it into the chat and we'll try to answer it as best as we can. Okay, Stephanie, we're ready for the next slide. Great, so we wanted to start out by introducing us um, ourselves and there's a little bit of information about us on the slide, but Maddie and I thought it would be fun if we would introduce ourselves by sharing our biggest garden, one of our biggest garden successes and also one of our biggest garden failures too, because gardening is definitely a, a learn by experience sort of endeavor. So um, one of my favorite things that I ever learned in the garden was that I can, I love to grow tomatoes. Um, they take up a lot of space in my garden because I love to grow a lot of them. And I figured out that I could plant carrots underneath my tomatoes and that they would sort of just slowly grow all season. And then in the fall, when I pulled up my dead tomato plants after the frost, there would be a bunch of carrots for me to harvest as well. So the year that I had my first under carrot tomato harvest, 
was great. Um, the biggest failure I've had in my garden was last summer, I tried to do that same thing with my eggplants because I figured eggplants are their cousins of tomatoes and I thought that might work. And the carrots just totally overgrew the eggplants and I did not harvest a single eggplant last year because I planted them way too close to all of my carrots. So that was my, my biggest failure in that, at least that I can think of. I still got lots of delicious carrots though, so it wasn't really a failure. How about you, Maddie? Um, I would say my biggest garden success when I was working in Salt Lake, I worked at a community garden organization and we as a team, I can't take full credit for this, but we grew a three foot cucumber, which was the biggest cucumber I've ever held. And it was like a child in my arms. So that was really awesome. And I would say one of my biggest garden failures, there have been a few last summer, I put up wall of waters around the tomatoes, which I've never worked with before. Um, and it got very windy one night and one of the wall of waters knocked over and got the tomato completely wet and it just froze in the night. So I would say I learned a lot from that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna move on to our next slide about awesome. figuring out what to grow. Okay, so the first question to ask yourself in the garden planning process is what do you want to grow? And maybe you're gardening for food or for aesthetics around your home, or maybe you just want a fun hobby, or maybe there's another reason. Um, whatever that reason is, it's good to start with an understanding of why you're growing so you can better decide what you want to grow and how much to grow. Um, you also want to ask yourself how much time you want to commit to this and how much labor you are willing and able to put towards a garden so that you don't overcommit yourself um, and you set reasonable expectations for your garden. I love Tori's comment about what about food, fun, and aesthetics. You can do all of those things for sure when you are gardening. Yes. Um, and it's really fun whether your family is you and your cat or you and your five kids to sort of think about gardening as a family. Um, it can really help if you, rather than having just one person plan out the whole garden, if you get buy-in right at the beginning. Um, so you can think about what does each person want to grow? You can even have folks in your family draw it out. Um, I don't have any kids yet, but I do have a husband who has lots of opinions on what vegetables we should grow and he <laughs> happens to work seasonally out of town so he's not going to be here when i'm planting a lot of things so down here on the side you can see um, our sort of very low tech garden map that we sat down before he left and we sort of sketched out okay what kind of things do we want to grow um and also thinking about how much do you want of each thing so i don't know if you guys can see but there's a down in the summer side of it, there's a Z that's been erased and a T is over top of it because I was gonna get gung-ho about planting tons of zucchini plants. And he reminded me that I don't really like zucchinis that much. So maybe we only need two zucchini plants instead of three of them. Probably that's still too many. Um, so think about how much do you wanna eat? If you have kids, having the kids like map out and draw out what they wanna see in the garden can be a really fun family activity. Um, and you can also think about giving kids a space of their own too. Maybe have one of your raised beds or one row that's um, Johnny's row or that's Amy's row and they get to plant whatever plants they want in it. You might not have the most production from that row, but they're gonna have a lot of investment in it and a lot of fun doing it and learn a lot too. Um, and it can be nice too when you're thinking about it, what do you guys want in the long term? Is there maybe, do you really wanna have raspberries? So. Maybe you try to plant some berries or flowers or other perennials rather than just food. Um, and also consider leaving some space for pollinators and other garden critters. Um, it can be really nice to see birds in your garden, to see bumblebees buzzing about um, and leaving a, a little bit of space for those creatures too, instead of just a really aesthetic sort of um, just crop production garden can be beautiful and fun. I love this picture up here. This is an example of a sort of a digging area for kids. Um, you know, they have some plants growing, they have some areas where kids can just do tactile activities and, and be gardeners without um, necessarily being a really production area of it. So think about what is your priority and what's good for your family and go from there. Let's see. 
Awesome. So the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about knowing where you're growing, um, whether that's through the hardiness zones or your climate. Um, so this image shows the USDA plant hardiness zones in Montana. And USDA plant hardiness zones are a standard used to help gardeners and growers understand their region and what plants can survive and thrive here. Um, but specifically, plant hardiness zones mostly relate to perennial plants like trees and shrubs. So think like fruit and nut trees. Um, and from the zones, we learn the average minimum temperature in an area. So the average minimum temperature will tell us what plants, what perennial plants specifically will survive the winter and grow another year. So looking at these zones, you can plan for perennials. And there is a common misconception that honestly, I believed until a few days ago that plant hardiness zones tell us what annual vegetables will thrive here. But in reality, that information is more so based on the climate in your area and the average first and last frost dates rather than the hardiness zone. Um, and it's also good to remember that these zones are just a guideline. And especially as we start to see more frequent irregularities in the weather, there are always gonna be unpredictable temperatures and weather events that happen to any grower, especially in Montana. Um, I'll just add one thing I do love, what I do love about this map is it shows you some of the big patterns in Montana, um, and that's that it's going to be more mild as you get to the northwest part of the state. So like there's a reason that Missoula is called the Garden City, and that they grow peaches in Paradise, Montana. Um, it's, it's a little bit longer growing season, a little bit less cold in the winter, and then as you get down to the Bozeman area, we're higher up, we're a harsher growing climate, and then if you get out to the plains, those ones get really, really cold in the winter out by Miles City and Glendive. Um, they have really hot summers, but they get cold, cold in the winter time. So it just sort of shows that variation among our, our large state that we have. Um, but in our particular area, the Bozeman and Gallatin Valley's growing climate, um, our last average frost day is usually around um, June 9th. So past Memorial Day. <laughs> um, when I was growing in Missoula, I used to never plant my tomato plants out until the weekend after Memorial Day. Um, in Bozeman, I'm going to wait a week longer even this year. Um, and then our first frost date is usually around early to mid-September. So that gives us about 97 average frost-free growing days. Um, and a lot of that is because we're so high up. Um, so we get those cold mountain nights and then we also get long hot days, which can be really beneficial for, um, for growing crops that like a lot of sunlight and that like to grow fast. Uh, tomatoes will just grow like gangbusters in the middle of summer here. Um, and Brianna, yes, there are ways to extend your growing season for annuals. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. Um, so there's ways that you can protect your, um, protect your crops from frost, different ways to do season extension. And there's also some things you can do when you're considering what plants to plant. So one thing is to plant cold hardy varieties. There are, for instance, if you're looking at pepper plants, there are peppers that are like called king of the north peppers um, and other plants that have been developed to be cold hardy, either because they were developed in cold areas or because crop breeders have developed them to be cold hardy. Um, another thing to look for is quick growing varieties. So I grow a type of jalapeno called, I think it's called fast jalapeno or something like that, but it, it's got a really short, shorter window compared to some other varieties of jalapenos. So it can get, it'll mature in our growing season. Um, one thing I really love to grow and it's really fun is to grow heirlooms from similar climates. So I like to grow a lot of tomatoes that were developed in Russia. Um, there's like the Russian black tomato and the um, there's one called Uralski Rainini that grows amazing here, um, and it's from the Ural Mountains. And so a similar climate and a similar sort of latitude to ours. There's also um, seed companies from Montana. So there's folks who have been developing and growing seeds in the Gallatin Valley area, as well as in other areas of Montana. Triple Divide Seed Co-op is a great source, um, and they actually, I believe, sell those seeds at the co-op, um, and you can buy those, and they're you know, they're, they're developed to be seeds that have grown from plants that grow well here. So those are all ways to sort of think about like, as you're picking a variety, maybe don't pick a variety of watermelon that does really well in Missouri or in Florida. Maybe pick a variety of, you know, um, 
northern watermelon if you want to try to grow those here. Um, another thing you can do is start your seeds indoors. So right now is a great time to start tomato seeds, um, peppers, eggplants, and you can start those now and get a jump on it so you can plant them outside. If you don't feel like you have the capacity at your house, maybe you don't have a good window for it, you don't really want to invest that space, um, you can also buy starts. And once you get towards June, if you go to the farmer's market or go to Cashman's or go to any sort of store around here, there's all sorts of places you can buy starts. Um, a really cool thing too is if you happen to have SNAP for your family, you can use SNAP and double SNAP dollars to buy starts from local farmers too. So um, there's lots of ways to sort of make that affordable as well. And then one thing we'll talk about later in here is frost protection and season extension. So there's ways that, you know, say, because we know in Montana, sometimes you get a July snow. Um, say that it's 4th of July and it's snowing. You can go out there with the sheets and put them on top of your tomato plants and keep your fingers crossed that it'll keep it safe. So there's lots of ways that we can um, sort of extend that. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that your elevation matters. So um, my sister-in-law lives up on the Bozeman Pass at that exit with the sea bears now sign at it. Um, and she's up in the mountains up there. Her growing season is even shorter than this because of her elevation. So if you're high up on a mountain, you're gonna have a shorter growing season and maybe need to do more of that season extension. On the other hand, if you have a section of your garden that's just like always in the sun and it's in a raised bed, it might get warmer and be able to grow some crops sooner than that. So just some things to think about. Um, and if you're not in the Bozeman Gallatin Valley area growing, the Old Farmer's Almanac is a great source to find out what your last and first frost date are. So that's where these ones are from. And you can look there as well for wherever you are. Awesome. So now let's talk about reading your seed packets. I feel like this is something that a lot of people overlook when they start gardening. Um, seed packets are a wealth of knowledge. They contain more than just those little balls of life that'll help you grow your garden. They also have a lot of information specific to the seeds that you're trying to grow, such as days to germination, days to maturity, when to start your plants inside, when to direct sow the seeds, at what depth you should plant the seeds, the sun and shade needs, how to best care for your plants and harvesting notes. So one of the most important things that I always look for on my seed packets is days to maturity. And days to maturity is just a guideline. And I tend to look at the larger number if there's a range of numbers listed, especially if I don't know where the seeds are normally grown. If you're ordering seeds specifically from Russia, because you know that those are going to do well in Montana, then you can probably trust that days to maturity number. But if you are unfamiliar with where the seeds are grown, or if they're grown in a warmer climate zone, I would go with the larger number in the range, just because in Montana and Bozeman, it might take a little bit longer for those seeds to reach maturity. So using that days to maturity number and the first frost date number and a calendar, you can calculate the times to plant inside or outside. So what I like to do, um, we'll look at this Swiss chard packet. It says 65 days to maturity on the larger range. So 65 days, and I know that the first frost is around early September. So I'll pull up a month by month calendar, go to early September, say let's choose September 1st and count 65 days backwards. And that probably puts us around the end of June. So I know that if I want to have my chard fully matured before the first frost, I need to be putting that in the ground towards the end of June, unless I plan to have some kind of season extension or some protection for that chard. I'll know that I want it to reach maturity before frost returns. Um, and you can use that method for any vegetable, but it's really important to think about days to maturity for things that are not frost resistant at all, things like your tomatoes or your peppers or your squash. Maddie, there's a great question in the talk right now. Is it from seed to harvest or is it from start to harvest? It's from seed to harvest is my understanding. That's how I always treat it at least. Um, but I would add that, especially in our climate, like 
the fall, as things get closer to the fall, we get less and less light. And also things like forest fire smoke can impact how fast plants grow because it cuts down on the amount of radiation that's available to them to photosynthesize with. And so giving, definitely going with the longer end of that spectrum and even giving yourself a little bit more time is very wise to do. Cool. Okay, so another thing to do is plan out where you want to plant plants. So your seed packet will also tell you how far apart plants need, and you should do that. As my story about putting your um, all of your giant carrot plants right next to and up against your eggplants shows, plants don't like to be crowded, just like people don't like to be crowded too much. So give them the space that they need to grow, and a garden map or a diagram can help. Um, I actually found both of these examples on the internet. So if you're like, just want to look up, hey, I want to do a four by eight raised bed garden and I want to grow these things. There are probably some blogs on the internet that give you some good ideas about how far to place things apart. But there's going to be some things like tomato plants, tomatillo plants, zucchinis, squash that need more space, some things that need less space and some things that can be planted really, really close together. Um, like lettuce, you can plant basically just scatter the seeds around and then cut it off as lettuce mix. So um, definitely pay attention to what your seed packet says um, to figure out how fast or far apart you want to put things. We'll explain a little bit more about this in a second, but intercropping and succession planting and companion planting can help to make a small space a lot more productive. Um, another thing to try to do as you're planning out your garden is try to rotate your crops to a new spot each year. Um, especially types of crops. So like kales and broccolis and cauliflower are all a similar, they're all cousins of each other. And you don't really wanna keep planting your kale and your broccoli and your cauliflower in the same spot, just like you don't wanna plant all your tomatoes in the same spot year after year. The reason for that is that those plants need certain um, nutrients to grow and they also tend to attract the similar kind of pests. And so, if you plant like your broccoli in one spot year after year, it's going to deplete the nutrients that broccoli needs and you're going to see a reduced production after a while. Same thing with pests, you'll start to see a buildup of those pests that feed on broccoli in that area. So rotating around can be really great. One thing I like to do to help me with that is I have a garden journal and I just, I map out my garden every year because when you're planting them in June, or harvesting them in September, you think you will remember, and then it gets to the next year and all of a sudden you've forgotten where you planted everything. So making a map or a diagram, even if it's just a simple sketch can be really helpful. Um, another thing to think about is paying attention to your sun and your heat needs for plants. So tomato plants, pepper plants, eggplants, they are all heat loving, sun loving crops. They come from um, tropical areas like Central America and India and they really like, like they, they just love sun. If you plant a tomato plant in shade, you're not gonna get very many tomatoes. On the other hand, crops like lettuces, um, zucchinis, squash, they can do better in sort of that part shade area. So your seed packet will also tell you if things need a full sun or part sun and just pay attention to that. One time I tried to plant watermelons in part shade and I just got a bunch of watermelon vines and no watermelons. So um, definitely, it, it definitely makes a difference. Um, and like I said, there's a ton of good um, garden templates and Janelle shared via the chat that Garden Plan Pro is a great free app for garden plan planning too. So thanks for sharing that resource. Um, there's lots of good information out there. And so, you know, people have learned through trial and error, you might as well benefit from their knowledge. Awesome. So now let's talk about when to plant. Um, planting calendars have become super useful to me since I've been gardening. They help me stay organized and know how to plan for my season for maximum abundance, especially when we're talking about days to maturity and making sure I'm going to be harvesting some of those um, frost non-resistant plants in the fall, like my tomatoes and my squash. Um, so there are a variety of planting calendars that you can find for free online. And some can be used just as a reference to plan your actual schedule and make your own calendar, um, such as the top image that we have up here. And that is from the Old Farmers Almanac website. So that tells you the first frost, the last frost, and then when you should expect to plant things. 
a lot of calendars should tell you those important dates, um, especially spring, fall, and succession planting recommendations for certain vegetables. So you can use those as a recommendation or you can use those as your calendar. I find that it's really helpful to make a calendar on my month to month calendar and actually write down the general time frame when I want to be planting things or harvesting things. So on my calendar, I'll put the last frost, the first frost, when I need to start my seeds, about when I can expect to transplant them, and then about when I can expect to be harvesting them. And that just helps me stay organized. Maybe you don't need to do that much, but, but I find it's really helpful. Um, and then that bottom image there is just an example of my planting calendar on my Google calendar. It's simple and helps me stay on top of what I'm supposed to be getting in the ground when. Here's uh, another example. Um chart planting calendar from Montana. So um, I just wanted to point out with this, one thing that you can keep in mind with plants too, is that there's certain plants that don't really like the middle of July. So um, there's some plants that if you try to start kale or lettuce right in the hottest part of our season, those seedlings aren't going to do too well. Um, they are affected by the amount of light and also they really like to stay moist and pretty cool as they're germinating. So um, plants like beans and cabbage and tomatoes and peppers, um, those all do really well in the hot, hot area. So focus your time in the middle of the summer on those. Um, but then for plants like beets and kale and lettuce, you can start some now or um, pretty soon and have them be ready to harvest by the end of June. And then you can also start another crop later um, and have them ready to harvest by the end. Um, you'll also see on this calendar that there's some of them that are going past our last frost date. That's because crops like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, and spinach, they are all cold hardy plants that actually, they produce some um, different chemicals. In the case of brassicas like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, there are the oligosaccharides, which are really good for you. And the reason that the plants make them is because they are frost protections. They're actually like antifreeze in the frost, so, or in the plants. So the plants can keep growing and thrive until it gets too cold. <laughs> um, in some places in the country, you can grow kale all winter long. In Montana, there comes a point about October where we get a really hard frost and it's done, but you can keep some stuff growing past that last frost date. So that's sort of nice to know and plan for too. Um, one other way that you can extend your harvest and also make the most of your space is by thinking about succession planting. So succession planting is when you start some of your seeds at a different time over the course of the season rather than all at once. Um, this is something that I personally have learned by trial and error because I used to plant all my lettuce seeds right at the beginning of the season. And then in a few months, I would end up with more lettuce than I could possibly eat. And then the thing about lettuce and some of these other plants is that they don't really hold very well in your garden. So like I'd be going gangbusters with my salads for a few weeks and then all of a sudden all my lettuce turned bitter and bolted to try to produce its flowers. And I felt like I was wasting a lot of food. So what you can do instead is you can plant maybe a quarter of the amount of lettuce you want. And then two weeks later, plant some more of your lettuce and then plant some more. So in this image, you can see they've started, I think this is arugula that they're growing here. They had started some early and then they've got more that they started and then some that's just coming up. So they'll have sort of a, an ongoing amount of arugula. This can be really helpful, especially for things that bowl like lettuce, cilantro. Um, can also be helpful for carrots just because they'll, they'll be ready to harvest. And so you can plant some early on, harvest them and have them in your salad with lettuce and then grow some that you can have later on for um, either storage or just eating in the fall. So. There's a really great resource um, from Johnny Selected Seeds, which is a seed company out of, um, I think they're out of Maine. And I'm gonna try to pull this up. Let's see. So this is, they have this, it's a free thing to download. It's a planting succession spreadsheet calculator. And basically you can like put in your, you can keep track of it. You can put in your name of your plant, how many days to maturity, how often you want to plant it. So, okay, I want to do it every 14 days and it will just automatically calculate out for you what dates you should be planting your successions with. Just pretty cool um, if you want to have something that, that sort of plans that out for you. 
I mean, of course, there's some days where you're like, I'm really busy with work and I can't possibly be planting right now, but at least it gives you sort of a, a time frame for that. Um, another thing that you can do, especially in our season, something I'm going to try out this year in my own garden is planting some hot season crops like tomatoes after you've already harvested earlier crops. So right now in my garden, I've got some radishes that are starting and some spinach. I've got them under some, a floating row cover, which I'll explain on our slide here in a little bit um, about, it's a season extender sort of fabric stuff you can put on top. And the spinach and the radishes are up. I'm planning to harvest them before I plant my tomatoes and then put my tomatoes in that same spot. So, um, if you have limited space, that's another way that you can sort of think about harvesting that. Or like after you harvest your garlic, which gets harvested in July, maybe then you plant um, some of your greens that you wanna have in the fall there. So just thinking about how to use that space in a, in a sort of rotational area. Um, another thing you can do to maximize your production is doing intercropping or companion planting, which are very similar. It's basically planting different plants near each other. Companion planting is like technically defined as when plants help each other out. So um, there's a very famous book called Carrots Love Tomatoes. And if you plant tomatoes near the carrots, the carrots help to um, keep crop pests off of your tomatoes. Um, but you can also just plant things together that are like a taller plant near a shorter plant. So they're not competing over the same amount of space. Or lettuce plants tend to have really sort of shallow root systems and can grow neat, well near plants that have deeper root systems like carrots, for instance. Um, another thing that people like to do and just that makes your garden beautiful is to plant beneficial flowers and herbs like basil or marigolds near insect prone crops. So you'll often see marigolds growing at the end of rows. Marigolds produce a natural sort of insect repellent and it helps keep bugs off your crops or basil is often planted near tomatoes not just because they make good sauce together, but also because the basil tends to keep pests off your tomato crops. So an advantage of that is, again, it makes the most of your space and it also increases diversity and habitat for all those beneficial things that you might want in your garden. Here's some other images that show like some examples here. Um, one thing you can also do is plant a crop like lettuce near crops like leeks or onions because the lettuce will mature faster. So you grow that, it grows faster, you harvest it by the time that the onions start to get big. Um, here you've also can see some kale that's growing near some marigolds. So that kale will eventually get big and tall and overtake those marigolds. But in the meantime, the marigolds are helping to keep the pests off the young and vulnerable kale. Um, so there's lots of ways to do this. Sometimes it ends up, I mean, honestly, I would recommend if you've got a little bit of creativity, to give it a try. Um, sometimes it will work really well, like your carrots or your tomato plants. Sometimes it will not work really well, like your carrots or your eggplants. Um, but try it out in your garden and see how it goes. And then another way to extend your season is, like Brianna was asking about earlier, frost protection. So one of the things to, to do is to just plant some frost tolerant crops. Um, peas, you can plant peas out right now. And if they come up before the frost, they'll be fine. Um, they, they like cold weather, they can tolerate frost, especially some of the cold hardy varieties. Radishes, um, kale and spinach, those are all plants that you can put out in your garden now. Um, it might take a little bit of time for them to start germinating, but they will, they will eventually grow and they'll be okay if they freeze. Um, not, not down to like 10 degrees, but down to the low 30s, they'll be fine. Um, Another thing you can do is cover things with blankets or tarps. Um, in this picture where there's the, the lettuce growing, you can see this fabric. I know it by the trade name called Rime. Um, it's also known as floating row covers. Um, it's a little bit more pricey to invest in, but a nice thing about it is that it actually lets water and light through. So like I have it on my garden right now in the places where I'm trying to grow radishes and spinach and it's keeping it warm, protecting it from frost. But when it does rain, those plants get it and they're still growing underneath it. You can also, I see a lot of people in Bozeman, they'll make little hoop tunnels for that so that as your crops start to get bigger, they can still get protected from it. Um, these folks down here with the cups, they just use plastic cups over top of their baby plants and that will provide some protection from frost too. 
and the cheapest lowest cost way is to use your towels or use your sheets or use whatever you've got around um, to protect your plants especially like if we have one of those those frosts that come after you expected the frost to happen um, that can be a really good way or the frost you know an early frost at the end of august or something when you watch the weather report and think oh my gosh my tomatoes aren't ready to harvest yet um throw throw whatever you've got over them and see how it works um and then one trick that i heard um when i was in an agroecology class was that a lot of fruit farmers will actually turn their sprinklers on on freezing nights so and this works for other things too um if you've got a, a garden where you've got a sprinkler and you can run it on a freezing night the frost or the the ice will actually form around your vegetables but it won't let it get below 30 degrees or 32 degrees um and so it will actually keep it from getting colder than 32 degrees just like snow insulates things so that can also be sort of a, a last ditch effort to save things in the fall and then another thing to think about too like we mentioned before is just buying starts um, or growing starts and planting them after you expect that frost to happen so you know if, if you want to grow tomatoes from seed here it's not going to work if you stick them in the ground in june you've got to sort of you stick the seeds in the ground in June. You've got to start them now, give them a time to, to grow up and become big tomato plants and then put them outside too. So um, those are some ways that you can sort of extend your season. Um, uh, just one other thing, I didn't put it on the slide, but just as I'm talking about tomatoes, if you pick green tomatoes and put them in a box, they will turn red eventually too. So do not fear if your plants um, start to freeze and you're like, I, I just can't cover them all. Um, get them, clean them off as best as you can, put them in a box and they will ripen themselves. So I think that that was all that we were gonna plan to share with you guys, but I've been seeing some good questions in the chat and um, we would love to welcome other questions too. If you guys have things that you're curious about or if you have tips, if you've got um, good crops that grow here or good season extension methods, we would love to, to talk about that. So I'm seeing one question. How do you know which plants will be most sensitive to germinating in the heat? One thing that you can do is um, look on your seed packets. So oftentimes they will they will tell you if you're like what what is a good temperature for germination. So if you see a seed packet that says um, like start outside before the frost, you can probably guess like thinking backwards that that's going to be something that doesn't do as well in starting out in the in the heat of summer um and then some of them will say some seed packets will actually say like plant in the spring or in the fall or some will say plant throughout the summer for a continuous harvest so those seed packets tell you a lot and it definitely depends on the plant and the plant variety but um yeah that would be the best the best thing to do is look at seed packets and then also seed catalogs, which a lot of them are available online, also have a lot of great wealth of resources too. So yeah, great question. Any other questions? And feel free if you don't feel like chatting in the, or typing in the text chat box, you can also just turn your microphone on and ask away. Something that I was curious about is when you're, um, you know, trying to get a family involved and play with kids, what are some of the best crops for kids to grow, given that, you know, they kind of want to see results right away? That's a great question. Maddie, do you have any thoughts? You grow lots of plants with kids. Yeah, definitely. I would say taste friendly plants and things that grow quickly. Um, lettuce is usually a crowd pleaser. Peas, Anything that will surprise them when they pull it out from the soil, carrots and beets, although they take longer, it's very magical to watch kids harvest those because they're different sizes and different shapes and it's it's a lot of fun. Um, even, even like sweet things, 
plants that have a little bit higher sugar content, like some sweet tomatoes, kids will just pop those in their mouth all day long. So I would say those as well, even though they're not, they're not super quick, not instant reward, but it's nice for the kids to care for them through the summer too, and then get to taste their bounty. One other one that I think is just, it's a particular variety of a plant, but it's so fun. It's called Tom Thumb Popcorn. And it is, it grows to be about four feet tall. So it's like kid height popcorn and it grows well in our climate. It grows fast enough that you can. And then it's just so fun to grow your own and then pop your own popcorn later on too. So um, I've grown that in school gardens before and it's always a huge hit when we in the fall harvest our popcorn. Um, great. Let's see, Janiel's asking in the chat, I've heard that afternoon sun is the most important for plants. Should you plant garden to get the most light from the northeast, west, or south? That's a great question. Um, I think one thing that would, one thing matters too is your particular location that you're in. So um, one thing I like to do is sort of try to look at my garden throughout the day um, and see, like if you have a tree in your yard, um, you can sort of it can cause problems for you. <laughs> and this is the time of year where you can't really tell because there's no leaves on them, but try to imagine where the light is gonna be. Also keeping in mind that as our summer goes on, our light is going to be much farther, our sun is gonna be much farther in the north. So um, I would say probably trying to get the most light from the north is gonna be the best bet because the we're so far north at our latitude that the northern sun is going to be the big thing. So if you if you're planning for it to get light from the south, um, it's going to get less and less light from the south as it goes. So um, the north is good. I've heard both things in terms of afternoon and morning sun. So I'm not I'm not really sure, Betty, if you have a, a thought about that. I think just in general, trying to get the most sun throughout the day that you can is the best. Yeah, I think so too. I I've heard morning, so I I'm sure it just depends on your location. Great question. One, one other thing that I was wondering, you you gave an anecdote about you know growing some watermelons in the shade and just having these vines and never any actual melons. If you're kind of new to gardening and you don't necessarily know, oh, it's because it was in the shade, what's a way to kind of figure that out if you're not sure if it's the light or the amount of water you're giving it or some other nutrient or something? That's a great question. To be completely honest, I Googled it. <laughs> I was like, why are my watermelons not growing? Um, and it was super helpful. Um, there are some certain ways to tell about certain nutrient deficiencies. So like if you've got a plant that is, so there's, there's three main nutrients that plants need. Um, there's a bunch of micronutrients they need to, but the biggest ones are nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. And the nitrogen one tends to really impact things. So if you see a plant that is just growing green stuff, nitrogen is sort of like the protein for plants. It's what they use to build themselves in their green material. If, if it's just growing green leaves, um, like if you have a tomato plant that's not putting out flowers and it's just growing green leaves, chances are you have too much nitrogen. If you have a plant that is has a bunch of yellowing leaves, especially the older leaves on it, chances are it does not have enough nitrogen. Um, there's not a lot you can do about too much nitrogen except for plan differently next year. Um, but if you don't have enough nitrogen in your soil, there's lots of different soil amendments um, that can be used to help put more nitrogen in there. One thing that I've always had success with in my garden is using fish fertilizer, because um, I find that that's sort of a, a readily available organic um, not harmful. Like they make it out of like waste from the fish industry. So um, it's, it tends to be a pretty effective thing. I think, I can't remember exactly what my, my first boss when I was working in school gardens used to call it like power punch or something like that for the, for the vegetables. But um, so that can be a really good one. Um, there's a couple other ones that sort of like, you know, if you read gardening books or as you sort of become become attuned to it, you can find out. I one time had my tomato plants, they were all getting what's called blossom end rot, where like the end of them was rotting off um, before they were ready to harvest. And I Googled it, I found out that it was a calcium deficiency. 
And so what I do now is when I plant my tomato plants, I save um, my eggshells for a few weeks beforehand and I crumble them up really small and plant them in with the, with the tomato plants and that tends to help. So um, there can be some ones that are specific to plants, but honestly, it's all, all my learning has been through trial and error and then, oh, why didn't this work and what can I do next for next year to try to make it better? Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions, you guys? These have been super fascinating. Hi, I have a, a question. Um, I picked up some of your seed packets from the seed library and I've never planted Brussels, broccoli or either of the melons. Um, there was a green melon and an orange melon. So do you have, I mean, I'm guessing the melons need a very sunny spot and maybe a place where the vines could grow up like a fence or something. But yeah. what about the broccoli and the Brussels? What tips do you have for, and I, I did start, I've started all those as little baby plants right now, but. Maddie, do you have any tips on that? I don't, I was just gonna say you are brave. I've never tried Brussels I or know. broccoli. Well, I can also just read the, the back of the packet, but. They like, um, they like nutrients. So uh, Brussels and broccoli both like a lot of nitrogen in your soil. So if you have a chance to put any compost in before you plant them outside, that'll be helpful. Okay. They like full sun. Um, okay. Kate said the broccoli is easier than Brussels sprouts. I would agree. Um, <laughs> they're, but they're actually, they're, they're the same species of plant, which is just fascinating. Um, yeah. Brassica, like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, they're all all varieties of the same basically plant. So if you let them cross breed, they will end up just going to turn into a mutant broccoli sort of thing. Okay. Um, one thing that you might see um, towards the fall, just to keep it in mind, is that the one of the, we're lucky in Montana that we don't have a lot of crop pests here because it gets so cold in the winter, mm -hmm. but one that can survive is cabbage aphids. So if you start to see little gray bugs on your plant, the easiest way to get rid of cabbage aphids is to spray them with your hose because they don't have wings. So if you just knock them onto the ground, <laughs> that's a really quick way, but if you, you got to get on top of it first. So if you start to see that they start to like, they like to eat Brussels sprouts and broccoli heads. So um, that's one way. Another thing you can use is there's um, neem oil, like another organic um, sort of thing that can help with that too. But um, they, they're frost resistant, so they should grow really well here and they like our long days in the summer. So good luck. Sounds like you should have some delicious broccoli and Brussels sprouts and melons and stuff. Thank you. Um, and since you brought up the neem oil, um, so we, we were told, I, we work with our neighbor in her garden and she likes to be really organic, uh, which is great. Um, and so she recommended neem oil, but then we were told that it can kill bees. So you should put it on like first thing in the morning before the bees are active. I didn't know if you'd heard. Thanks for sharing that. I wasn't aware of that, but it makes sense. Um, so yeah, um, there's another thing that people sometimes do. They call it insecticidal soap, but essentially it's just like you can mix dish soap with water um, and then spray it on like right on the aphids too. Mm -hmm. All of those would have packed insects the same way though, because what it does is it gets, it helps, it breaks down their exoskeletons. So yeah, I think trying to be specific on like, I see the aphids there, I'm going to put the neem oil right on the aphids and then trying to avoid before the bees wake up in the cold, the cold mm -hmm. temperatures, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing that. I'll be more aware of when I put my neem on. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, and Kate is sharing some really great um, stories about broccoli and things like that too in the, in the um, things. And Kate, I have a question for you about your broccoli. Did you, when you say you sour harvested several heads, did you like cut the top head off after it had uh, become ready to harvest and then it grew more of them outside of it? Yeah, because they'll, they'll grow more heads off the side of the broccoli plant after you get the first big one. So you can have an extended harvest. They're pretty fun. If anybody likes to watch, um, there is a great episode of Good Eats, that old Food Network show with Alton Brown, where he talks about cabbages, I think. And he talks all about the history of 
Brussels sprouts and cabbages and um, he brings in his food anthropologist friend to talk about how different parts of Europe developed all those different vegetables from the same plant that was growing as a wild weed in Europe. So it's just fascinating if you want to nerd out a little bit and learn some recipes. Any other questions? Well, I would just throw out there too, um, feel free to reach out to us. I didn't put my email on here, but um, our website is gbfarmtoschool.org. Um, and both Maddie and I are listed on there and as well as the rest of our staff. And we're happy to help solve garden mysteries too in the summertime. So if you guys get growing and you have questions, I know that there's also good resources through the seed library and seeds. Um, again, it's such a cool, Brianna, thank you so much for making this a a resource for our community. I think it's just going to be really exciting to, to see it continue to blossom. And then next week, same time, same place, maybe different place. I'm not sure if the Zoom link's the same, but same time, same virtual space. Um, Maddie and I will be back and we'll be talking about small space gardening and container gardening. So if you've got sort of a, a tricky place and you need to figure out how to get the most out of your small spaces or make some creative containers, we would love to see you again um, and tell your friends. So thank you everybody for joining us. We'll stick around if there's more questions, but otherwise I think this is pretty much it for the evening. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie and Maddie for sharing all of your knowledge. And for those of you here, we also are doing um, part of an Earth Day community festival outside the library and there'll be seeds there too and all kinds of different programs uh, from around the community to kind of get you in the mood for spring. So you can definitely come by next week. We're so happy to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody.